it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Goiko Vujanovic. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, let me start here. So over the course of uh, this uh, past couple of days, uh, we've been learning about Jetscape. And really, there's two types of calculations that, that you can do in Jetscape. Uh, we learned about hydrodynamical calculations uh, yesterday and the day before by Chun. And today, what basically I'm going to be talking about is uh, about calculations that are done um, for jet energy loss. So while the, 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 the hydrodynamical calculations were non-perturbative, uh, these calculations here are, are actually uh, perturbative calculations. So a quick, quick, very quick overview of uh, QCD. So we all know that QCD is an SU3 gauge theory. And uh, it has couplings that are similar to QED. For instance, in the, in, in the first diagram over here, this is the quark to gluon coupling. This is very reminiscent of what we have in, in, in QED. However, uh, in this coupling here, the, the gluons, of course, uh, carry both color and anti-color, which allow them to self-interact. And these self-interactions are either in these uh, three-point diagrams or in these four-point diagrams, okay? So the coupling that, that, that is present in these interactions is strictly speaking GS. That's the, that's the coupling that also shows up in the QCD Lagrangian. But oftentimes in colloquialisms, we would say that the coupling is alpha S, uh, which is related to GS in this way. So, so because we have these extra couplings in QCD, Okay, it actually makes it behave uh, differently than QED, for, that, uh, for instance. And the behavior is essentially seen in how the coupling constant, or alpha s really, is changing as a function of energy scale or as a function of virtuality. So virtuality is essentially how much uh, is the particle off its mass shell. So as a function of virtuality, uh, the alpha s actually is decreasing. So this basically means that QCD is an asymptotically free theory because the higher you go, the, the, the smaller the coupling is. Uh, at leading order, the expression of the running of the coupling is given by the equation down below here. So the fact that we have essentially a coupling that is small at, at, at high virtualities or high energies, uh, whereas it becomes larger at, 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 at lower energies, uh, allows us to essentially separate uh, different kinds of, of wavelengths or, uh, or energy scales. So if you're dealing with long wavelength or, uh, or low energy scales, okay, then the theory of course becomes uh, non-perturbative, but if you deal with these short wavelength energy scales, then the theory is perturbative. And uh, there's actually a factorization theorem that was proven that allows us to say that in order to be able to calculate cal uh, uh, PQCD calculations, okay, you can use the separation of scale, which is known as factorization, to be able to combine both the non-perturbative uh, over here and the perturbative aspects of QCD. So using this factorization scale, basically a matrix element that combines the non-perturbative here labeled by A plus B and the perturbative labeled by C plus D, when you square this matrix element in order to get the probability, uh, you essentially see that there is uh, no interference between these, uh, th th these two terms. Okay, which is essentially factorization that you can actually calculate uh, the, the, the long wavelength stuff and convolve the result with a calculation that comes from PQCD that is a shorter wavelength. So uh, how does this end up uh, uh, being applied in, 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 real, in real calculations? So basically, if you want to say calculate the, produ the production of hadrons in, in proton-proton collisions, let's say, uh, what you need to first figure out is, is what is the perturbative and the non-perturbative aspect. So the non-perturbative aspect comes from the fact that you need to fish out a parton, okay, be it a quark or a gluon, from your proton. So both from the projectile and your, and your target, okay? And for that, you would need these parton distribution functions, which are, are, are non-perturbative. So the best way to actually get access to them is to, uh, is to measure them in an experiment. And uh, it would, the easiest experiment to do that in is an experiment where you, you have one of the sources that you know very well and the other source that you want to study. So a source that we know very well is, for instance, electrons. And that you, the source that you want to study here is as a nucleus. So in electron nucleus collisions, uh, 
you, you, can, you can do that, you can, using, you can use those basically to extract parton distribution functions. And this essentially was done in, in Hera. Uh, okay, so once you've measured these parton distribution functions, then you can, you can collide two protons and extract quarks and gluons that come out of that. And in here, in this little uh, red box here, you can do your usual Feynman diagram to, uh, to, to perform the calculation the, way, the same the similar way that you would do it in, in QED. Okay, so then the next step is, of course, these partons are, are perturbative objects and hadrons are not. So you, know, you need another piece of non-perturbative physics. And that piece is coming here from the fragmentation function that essentially turns partons, uh, takes partons and turns them into hadrons. Now again, fragmentation functions in general are non-perturbative objects. And again, there you need to measure them first in experiment. Um, and uh, the simplest experiment that you can think of is, is electron and, uh, and positron collisions. So there you know both the, the target and the projectile, that's the electron and the positron. And then the only thing that you don't know is let's say that they annihilate and, and, and then they produce a virtual photon and the virtual photons goes into a, a quark anti-quark pair. And that quark anti-quark pair essentially then ends up fragmenting. And the fragmentation function is the only thing in the process that you don't know and you can go ahead and measure. So this is essentially what, what was done in, in LEP where they actually measured fragmentation functions, for instance. Okay. So uh, then you basically your, your total cross section, as I've just gone over here, the different details is a convolution of uh, uh, part on distribution functions, fragmentation functions, and a matrix element uh, that is calculated in uh, PQCD. Okay, so then the, the next step in the process would be to, uh, to go uh, uh, to take into account the possibility that one of the, the either the incoming guys or the outgoing guys can be associated with an extra radiation. Okay, so an extra split where you, where you have a gluon, let's say, attached to a quark. Okay, this extra radiation, what that will do is that will actually introduce a different scale. So you have one scale that is there for the hard scattering that you're trying to consider, and then there's another scale that enters in here that is uh, present at the, at the point of branching. Of course, this different, uh, the, uh, the, the, these different scales at the scattering and at the branching are associated with different alpha S's. And um, because of that, you need to take also the scale dependence uh, possibility, the, the scale dependence into account when you calculate your, uh, both your part, part on distribution functions and your fragmentation functions. And the way that, that this is typically done is to sort of generalize them by taking into account the virtuality dependence of uh, both uh, part on distribution functions and fragmentation functions. Now, the, the, I wanted to make a, 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 take a quick pause here before I start talking about heavy ion collisions and basically say that uh, part, on, part on distribution functions and fragmentation functions in relatively simple systems like E plus C minus or electron proton or a proton antiproton or proton proton collisions are quote unquote universal. What I mean by this is that you, can, you have to measure them in one of those systems, let's say, like I explained in E plus C minus for the fragmentation functions and in an in, in electron proton from, for proton distribution functions. And you can take these measurements and apply them onto collisions of uh, proton antiproton, for instance. This, of course, is valid provided that uh, you do not have a sizable nuclear medium that these partons have to travel through. Okay, if you do have a sizable nuclear medium, then these, 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 these parton distribution functions, uh, well, the fragmentation functions uh, really are not going to be, uh, are not going to be universal in that sense, right? We'll have a medium correction that, that happens there if you have a quark gluon plasma, say, that it's created. And instead of having a proton, if you have a nucleus, then the distributions of quarks and gluons in the nucleus is different than the quarks and gluons in the proton. And then your, your parton distribution functions is also, also going to get modified. Okay. So this, the, the, there is universality, but it's not completely universal for, for these two uh, parton distribution functions and fragmentation functions. Okay. So uh, let me quickly go uh, a little bit uh, into the meaning of what the, does it mean to have like a fragmentation function or a part and distribution function in this case that depends on energy scale, okay? So the, you can really think about that in the following sense. You can think about it as that Q squared, okay? Uh, 
or your energy scale is, uh, is really like a microscope, okay? So if you have a collision, let's say between an electron and nucleus, for instance, at very, very low virtuality, say, let's say 0.1 GeV squared or, or even lower than that, okay? Then basically the, the, the photon that is exchanged in this collision is not going to be able to resolve the fine details that are present in your proton or in your nucleus and uh, you will not be able to say, uh, that you, will not, you will not be able to see essentially that, that you have substru substructure. However, if you go to uh, higher virtualities, okay, so let's say, like, let, let's, uh, let, uh, let's look at collisions uh, at 2 GeV, then all of a sudden, the virtual photon here is going to be, uh, start to be sensitive to the quark degrees of freedom that uh, are, are happening inside of the, the proton or the nucleus. And this is essentially where you will see the Spartan distribution functions coming in, okay? Now, if we take this to the next level and, and then apply even higher energies, so you have an even uh, more virtual photon that is being exchanged here, then even more degrees of freedom are gonna be, uh, become available and you will store not only start, uh, see, uh, see the quarks, but you will also start seeing the gluons pop up to here as well. And actually by the, by the point over here, when you're at 10 GeV, if you look at the gluon distribution function, which is this guy over here, it actually is, is pretty much the dominant uh, pattern distribution function of the entire, uh, uh, of the entire system. Uh, and it, you know, it may not seem like that in this, in, this, in this graph, but if you pay close attention to the actual scale that is, that is used here, you can see that the, the gluon distribution was actually renormalized by a factor of 20. So really this line is lying uh, high above these other lines. Okay, 